More than 250 experts in the traffic signals industry join together in person to hear a range of papers here in Nottingham. These recordings are brought to you by AGD Systems, Colas, SRL Traffic Systems, Smart Video and Sensing, Vivacity and Unix Traffic. Hi everybody, good morning. Um, yes, as Chris has just said, so this is part three of a three-part um, series that we've been lucky enough to be able to present here at JCT, um, which is going to tell you about our Smart Junctions project, which has been a three-year project that we've um, has been part funded by Innovate UK. And we've been lucky enough to work with Transport for Greater Manchester to be able to deliver. So at Vastity, our aim is to provide cities with the tools to be able to um, build more sustainable and citizen-centric transport networks. So at the heart of all of that um, has been our data. Many of you will be familiar with our, our sensor data already. So we believe that you need more data, better data, to be able to understand how people are moving and using transport networks. And about three years ago, we took the leap from this passive monitoring into active signal control. And what we set out to do was to help cities modernize the traffic signal control systems. So when coordinated control was initially uh, developed, it was entirely focused on congestion to solve congestion problems. Um, it was cutting edge at the time. It was really exciting the industry and really created the step change for the industry as a whole. If we fast forward about 30 or 40 years now, um, the congestion has gotten worse, but our challenges have gotten more complex. And the needs of, of uh, cities have become more complex with air quality and sustainable transport being the real focuses as well as reducing this congestion. So the existing systems just haven't been able to keep up with, with these changes in focus and priority and policy. And at the same time, the experts that have been able to deploy and maintain these systems are starting to retire and leave the industry with the new generation just not having the skills to be able to maintain these legacy systems. So our goal was to address these issues and provide a more modern system that able, is able to give all of you um, the tools to be able to implement a broader set of objectives more efficiently. So we wanted to be able to create tools to allow you to optimize for different modes of transportation, as well as being able to um, de deploy these sort of strategies at a citywide level more effectively. But of course, we don't want to lose sight of what existing systems do well. We wanted to improve on that, so improve on optimization at various different scales and also create a system that is able to even more adaptively change to, change to quick changes in demand. Um, all the while, of course, we want to reduce the cost, reduce the effort required in maintaining and keeping your systems running um, effectively. So we believe that AI was a solution. This was our hypothesis for a couple of reasons. So um, firstly, on, our, on the sensor side, there had been leaps in computer vision um, and computer processing that made the accurate low latency um, data that is really required for this really adaptive control on, uh, for traffic signals, more cost effective. And so I've showed a little video of our, of our data already. Um, and on the signal control side, we'd already seen that deep learning had made leaps and bounds across a variety of industries. So from image recognition to voice recognition to basically you know, video games and things like that, with reinforcement learning able, being able to, for the first time, beat professional uh, players of, of Go, AlphaGo being the most um, kind of famous example of this application. And we believe that reinforcement learning was well suited to these problems for, for, for traffic signal problems for a couple of different reasons. It's been shown to be very reactive. It's also been sh shown to be very generalizable to a lot of different scenarios. On top of that, it's a reward-based system. So what it can do is if you set a high-level policy, it's able to implement that high-level policy without having to do a lot of manual work to implement that. So this was our hypothesis, this is what we set out to do. How did it go? So the first thing that we had to do was to prove that AI is able to be trained to control traffic. So we did that in simulation first. We used our traffic data to calibrate various micro simulations and started to train an algorithm in this environment. So reinforcement learning is an experiential, experience-based um, learning system. So it learns by trial and error. So simulation is obviously key. We don't want to let out an algorithm that doesn't really know anything about traffic control into the real world. But we trained our algorithm across hundreds of thousands of hours of simulation, and it started to exhibit good behavior, so much so that we were confident that we could 
start to deploy into the real world. The next, we needed to create a system that we believed could be safely deployed in the real world, and we did this in partnership with Transport for Greater Manchester, who provided the initial kind of help with the initial design, making sure that we had safety critical sign-off. In order for us to create something that we could put in on the street and we could ensure wasn't going to cause any serious problems. So the way that the system works and what we've created is it starts with our, da with our sensor data. So our sensor data is used in two ways. First, it is used to feed our traffic simulation. So we build this simulated, simulated environment where our algorithm is trained. And secondly, it's also used in the real world control. So it feeds the algorithm in real time based off of the, the traffic conditions around the junction. This data is, of course, not just vehicle data. It's information about pedestrians, cyclists, different types of vehicles all around the junction. And as well as the connected nature of, of our system, it can give you information about upstreams as well and nearby junctions. Obviously, throughout the last couple of years, travel has been difficult. So building tools to allow us to uh, remotely control and monitor has been critical. So we've also built systems that allow us to understand what the algorithm is doing, what the, control, what the controller is doing, and also using the cameras um, as to give us blurred video to allow us to make sure that everything was okay on the ground. And we've provided these tools as well to, to TFGM at the same time. So last year, I presented that the system had been live across three junctions, so all those, those two points had been proven. So what was left to do was to basically prove that not only was it possible, but it could actually rival the existing systems and, exist, and rival them in two different ways. So firstly, on congestion, which is we want to make sure that the that we're doing a better job, or at least as good of a job as Scoot and Mova, but also on this multi multimodal point that I made earlier. Second, how did it go on this? So how did it go? Um, so I'm really excited to kind of announce our big high-level figure at the moment, which is that we have managed to um, observe a reduction in journey times across kind of our key target junction of 23% um, for motorized vehicles. So this is our congestion metric. And the way that we calculated this was we have upstream sensors that are uh, gathering ANPR data. So we are using the journey times across all the, all the different uh, routes through this junction. And what you see in this graph is in orange, so the median journey times throughout the day while the incumbent scoot system is in control. And in blue, our median journey times while the Vasity system is in control. And we did A-B testing across the period of an entire month to gather this data. So it's really kind of important to see here as well is that it's not just doing well across one period of the day. It's not doing well across peaks or off peaks or evening peaks. It's doing well across the entire range. So what it's doing is actually very, um, it's adaptive. It's adapting to these changes in demand by itself independently. So the second one, of course, was multimodal. So what we um, developed was this, as an algorithm where we could actually place different weights on vehicles and pedestrians and we started to deploy the system and do some testing alongside um, of the different modes. So at the bottom, you'll see vivacity mo vehicle mode and pedestrian mode, where we gave, obviously, relative weights to the pedestrians and vehicles, and I shifted those around. Um, so the pedestrian stage for this specific junction is the orange, as you can see in this chart. Um, I think it's kind of no surprises here that during a pedestrian mode, you're giving much more time to pedestrians than in the vehicle mode. But I think what's also really important to note is that the algorithm itself is balancing demand just more generally. So the, um, we're running much more pedestrian time as well with compared to the fixed time control that is by the TFGM default at this junction. And now I'm gonna talk, hand it over to David, who's gonna talk about this project from the TFGM perspective. Yes, so thanks Raquel. Oh. Thanks Raquel for going through that for a bit of balance. We thought it was worth uh, sharing our side of the story as well um, and sharing some of our learnings along the way. It's been really valuable opportunity to see firsthand how the, tra um, how the future of traffic signal control has been developing. I'd actually like to start by reaffirming what Raquel said. Uh, yes, we actually have let AI uh, control high profile uh, high traffic flow junctions in Manchester and Salford. As you can see here, we selected junctions on and around the ring road um, to allow for a mixture of control of uh, junctions with high traffic flow, high pedestrian numbers, some with a bit of both, so to allow us to really push and test the technology. 
The, the circles actually represent where we had most of the equipment installed, um, with the yellow circles representing where we actually trialled most of the control. Um, this being said, um, as Raquel alluded to, we did do a bit of coordinated control, but most of the control was of junctions independently. So, since the last virtual JCT last year, um, one of the biggest changes uh, has been the shift to a much more frequent deployment schedule. Uh, previously, the guys at Vivacity would tell us weeks in advance, uh, and we'd look to try and find some resource to kind of cover this, uh, monitor the junction during the deployment, whereas now we've moved to an attitude where we're happy for the AI to run at short notice, pretty much whenever uh, the guys want, without us strictly monitoring. Recently, this has been around 50% of the time over the last couple of months. And on the slide here is one of the junctions Raquel actually shown where most of the deployments have actually taken place. Uh, it's quite a busy site, um, being on the ring road as well as at the end of a corridor heading into the city centre, uh, coming down from Strangeways there. Um, I'll start by saying uh, no major issues were observed throughout the deployments. Uh, performance of the agents was very good, probably best demonstrated by some of the figures that Raquel's shown. It took rational, logical decisions, serving different stages where appropriate, um, including taking into account pedestrian demand as well. Balancing this with, uh, with heavy traffic volumes, as I've said, though we did expect this to an extent with the guys at Vivacity having intensely trained the agent prior to deployment. I think there was one occasion where we had to revoke Vivacity control of the junction where performance was noticeably suboptimal. Uh, though this was quite a while ago, and I think it was actually the result of a couple of uh, faulty sensors, uh, which have since been rectified. We didn't really observe any adverse effects on the wider scoop region, uh, which is one thing we did have in the back of our minds. Uh, and one of the most noticeable differences to scoot or fixed time control um, was the lack of a fixed stage order. I'm quite aware that some authorities don't generally like to adapt, um, adopt this approach, but we found that having this flexibility within the AI um, allows for much more adaptability, such as uh, a highly saturated urban junction, such as this. So just to quickly kind of run through some of the challenges with the project, one thing we do think is worth mentioning is probably the vast amount of hardware that we've installed for the project. We've essentially been retrofitting 15 plus sites, tackling sometimes rusty old poles, controls at full capacity, and all the fun and games that go along with that. We do have to associate this with potential cost implications, and I think we, Ambivacity, need to be mindful that with additional equipment, uh, both in the control and up the poles, comes with additional maintenance responsibilities. We felt that similar to scoot loops, the sensors probably need to be able to capture the full extent of a queue where possible, and due to the angle or location of the sensors, this wasn't always possible for us. Uh, talking about lighting columns before, we, TFGM, don't maintain the street lighting, so that's a bit of a pain. Um, we also found that the actual training of the agent in simulation did seem to take time to get right. Uh, there was actually one instance where high traffic flows from a side road um, seemed to disrupt performance somewhat. Um, then the agent then had to be retrained ahead of a future deployment. Though the benefits of this are that the agent can then learn for future scenarios. Um, with all this being said, we've seen other significant benefits over the last three years, um, particularly in terms of the rich granularity of the data we've had access to, as Raquel has kind of gone through. Now, I have alluded to this in previous presentations, but it really can't be understated how much of an insight that this type of data can provide. We've been able to understand the impact of various levels of restrictions implemented over the course of the pandemic, um, helping us assess the impact on the transport network, retail, and various other services. We can also use this to help plan for events using examples and scenarios such as protests and football matches to help future network planning. This is where the project has been particularly valuable and where the added value of a smart junction system such as this has really shown through. Added features such as ability to use AMPR for journey times can of course be very useful. Uh, add this to the ability to use path tracing to understand pedestrian movements, potential conflict points, as well as speed data it really shows what a well-rounded data product the hardware actually is. So just to summarize then, uh, our thoughts as the, uh, as the test bed over the last three years, um, we're very comfortable with how the system has performed. 
probably best demonstrated by our willingness to let the AI run uh, pretty much unmonitored. We are still keen to further test the performance of the system, uh, particularly across areas with high PED volume, such as the Deansgate site uh, Raquel showed, where we feel that this could be a bit of a game changer. Uh, like other control systems, it's dependent on the installation and maintenance of hardware, though fault and failure across a project has been pretty rare. Um, the levels of the data that the system can provide are unparalleled, or so far as we've seen. Uh, that's not to say something else might not come along in future. And though we're keen for the system to continue to run, there probably needs to be some refining of the, uh, the Smart Junctions product, and I'm sure Vivacity will tell you that as well. But this being said, I think we need to recognize how much has been achieved in a relatively short amount of time. And Vivacity are really moving things forward with their technology and approach. And we're excited for the future to see where things go. Perfect. I will just do one, one more minute. I know that we're out of time. Right. But um, I'll just kind of finalize with a couple of what's coming up next for us. Um, yes, I will absolutely agree with David. We are doing a lot of work um, around R&D and research and investing into both reducing the amount of hardware that we have to install on site is something that's top of our mind, not only to reduce the amount, the quantity, but also the cost to make it more cost effective. And a lot of our time as well is going into automation. So bringing down that time that, are, that is required for us to calibrate the simulations and also to train the, the agent. So a big push from our side on that, on that element. For the rollouts, um, we are still rolling out the system across regions of, of, of Greater Manchester. So over the next year, we're going to actually focusing our efforts around um, the A6 corridor as part of the DCMS Smart Junctions 5G project, which we're also partnered with TFGM on to look at coordinated control across this region. Um, and kind of finally as well, I would be remiss um, to not talk about the deployments that we have across the rest of the UK as well. So we've recently developed, um, deployed the system, the full system in Cambridge and Peterborough, working very closely with, with Chris on that, um, and have started um, live trials there as well. We will be kind of launching in a, another early adopter program in the beginning of next year, so look out for that. Um, and as well as that, we've also been working with Leeds and Sheffield over the past couple of years to integrate our, our sensors directly into their controllers for uh, the, the pedestrian and cyclist detections at various crossings as well. So more rollouts around the UK and just continuing to gather that data and work closely with all of you. Um, thank you so much for all of your time and appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>
Rob. Rob Perry from Dorset. Um, I noticed on one of your slides you refer to uh, the stage sequence being well, randomised almost. It can appear and disappear. What about um, people expecting the next stage to appear, specifically pedestrians who quite happily follow in as soon as they see a red appear to traffic will walk out <laughs> in the road? I do that and in my Have you done any well. analysis to whether that has caused you problems? Um, because the rest of it I think is excellent, but that does worry me. Um, yes, absolutely. So this is actually one of the restrictions that both Cambridge and Peterborough placed on us. So we have implemented a fixed stage order for those uh, sort of the, the, the trial junctions in, in both of those regions. So we can work with either one. Um, we've shown in simulation that, you know, with more freedom, we can get better and more improvements. Um, but our system can work with a, a restricting the staging order to be a predictable stage order. Yeah, 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 Manchester. What your views are on that mm. Yeah, well, it's something we have monitored, something we've been cautious of, uh, but we found that most drivers, pedestrians, have been very observant of the signals. Um, you know, like Raquel, I'm one to cross the road if, uh, if I'm expecting a, a green man. Um, but, yeah, it's not something we've, we've really observed being much of an issue. Particularly in an urban area, we've found that pedest both pedestrians and vehicle users are following the signals as they probably should be, rather than trying to second guess what's coming next. Uh, should we go over there first? Simon Notley from Diddick again. I've heard if I ask enough questions, I get a free pass, so I'm <laughs> going for it. Um, I know uh, sort of explaining AI is one of those sort of notoriously intractable problems, but. I was interested in you, you kind of just eyeballing the junction and describing what you saw, and you, you said you noticed the stages were shorter and um, and obviously not in a fixed order, as we just discussed. Um, was there anything else you could say about the kind of characteristics? So, for example, did you notice it um, prioritising uh, fixed offsets like Scootwood or prioritising very tight envelopes around um, Q discharge like Moverwood? Was there any sort of noticeable characteristics? Not particularly. I know we commented on the lack of a fixed stage order, so that was probably the, bi the biggest thing. There was, I think, prior to the agent being retrained a couple of times, stages seemed overall shorter. But I know that was um, probably early on in the deployments. That I wouldn't say, yeah. Now the stage is kind of changing in, in lengths a bit more um, than it perhaps did towards the start. I think we commented quite a bit on the short stages at the start of the project, but. Yeah, it's changed somewhat recently, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Thank you. I was, I've always wondered, because I've been following this project since the start, and I've always wondered how much like the traditional traffic control um, algorithms the AI version might be. You know, we, the AI might invent Scoot independently, for, <laughs> for all we know. So we think that, especially as we do more coordinated control, um, it's going to start to mimic certain behaviors, but the, the beauty of RL in particular is that it can be quite creative um, and very reactive. So in theory, we should, ex we should see kind of mover-like behavior when demand is really high, scoot-like behavior when, when regional control is really important, um, or something else that we've never seen before, hopefully. Yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. Um, I think we had another question over. Oh, yeah, just. Thank you, Jonathan Bacorny from Dinick. Um, very impressive presentation. Being optically based, I'm interested, how does the system perform in the hours of darkness or, say, heavy rain when, obviously, visibility is much reduced? Um, excellent question. Um, it performs very well because Manchester is, well, Great Manchester is pretty well lit. Um, they're vision-based sensors, so, it, you know, as you can expect, if you can see it, they can see it. We also do train on, we've trained on hundreds and thousands of images, of which a lot of it is in these poor lighting conditions, and we actually are rolling out a huge system upgrade, which is even better and in poor lighting conditions. Um, 
for vehicles in particular, anything with, with headlights, it detects very, very well. Pedestrians at a distance are a bit, a bit tougher, but of course most of the pedestrians that we're concerned with are at the junction itself. So we're, we're looking for pedestrians that are in waiting areas. So the distance element for pedestrians is, a little, is much less of an impact. Um, I can get you numbers if you'd like at some point. I'm sure we've got, so we've got somebody from, from our sales team who can do that as well. Um, but we haven't witnessed anything. We are very lucky, it's still, it's still the summer, so we're gonna definitely, of course, continue to roll the system out throughout the winter, um, and, and we'll be making adjustments. As yeah, we have had the benefit of a well-lit study area for, yeah. for it, to be honest. Being quite close to the city centre, which has been fortunate. You know, maybe it's something else to uh, test further down the line. Thank you. Uh, were there any other questions? Oh, yep. Hi, uh, Mark Hewitt, ACOM. Um, just a quick one. I, I, I recall you mentioned about the uh, an incident where you had to take it offline um, due to faults. So I would just wondered if there's any if there's a feature within the AI system that would automatically take the system offline during certain criteria. Uh, yeah, we have just implemented. We're, we've, we've been developing that, and we're about to roll that out. So we do have certain metrics that if a sensor is offline, it will either kick it off of our system um, or kind of use a more deterministic kind of algorithm in the meantime while we um, debug or figure out what's wrong. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.